I was preparing for this message. We're in a, a, in a series called Grow, and really the subtitle is A New Way to Live, and we've been talking about how as Christians, when we get born again, it's not just a conversion experience, it's a learning a new way to live. And everything that we need to learn how to live is in the Bible. But when I was a kid, I, w I just went back home the other day to visit my mom, and you know, my mom still lives in the same house that I grew up in when I was a kid running around. You know, I, I go to my house, I watch, I, I go to the backyard, and it's pretty, it's old. <laughs> and uh, I'm preparing this message on love, and I'm reading Romans 13, and it's talking about loving others and how it fulfills the law. And I couldn't stop but remembering that the times in my life, all my life, my mother has always been a demonstration of a giver. We'd go, so in my house, it was chaos. Three, me, and, me and my two brothers and my sister and all of our friends, everybody was always at our house. We had a pool, right, well, growing up, and, and Thanksgiving was crazy. Anybody have a family like, if that's your family, you can raise your hand if that's you, but because we're proud of it. Or maybe you're not. We were the house, man. You went down there, there was 10 cars outside, you know. If there was a street football game going on, it was us. It wasn't anybody else on that street doing that. But we had a neighbor, and, and he lived with his mother, and, and he, he, he never married. The, the, the gentleman never married, and uh, he's our next-door neighbor. And his mom passed away, and he's, he's been alone a lot, all, all his life, most of his life. And I never saw this. You know, isn't it funny how you don't see things when you're young, but when you get older and you look back, you see things, and you see God. And, and I'm looking at this thing, and, and I, I noticed that every time we would do Thanksgiving or Christmas or We'd go over and cook a brisket, or there was a lot of food going on. You know, there was a lot of people at our house, and my mom could have had the attitude like, hey, you know, we got to feed everybody here. But I would always, we'd be sitting down to eat, and my mom would never sit down to eat. She'd serve everybody, and she'd be serving everybody, making sure everybody had their thing. And then I'd watch my mom go to the kitchen, grab a plate, and start making this plate and put a piece of foil over it. And I'd be like, what, what's that for? And she goes, oh, I'm taking it over to the neighbor. And she would, she would always think about that guy. And, and all her mind, you know, her mind was always like, he, ha he didn't have nobody. He, didn't, he doesn't have nobody. He wasn't related to us. He was just a neighbor, and he was just there by himself. And she could have used the excuse, I got too many people over at the house, and I got my own things going on over here. All the grandkids are here. All the kids are here. But she just had this thing in her that she was always like, I, I need to take him something because nobody, if, if I don't take him something, no one will take him anything. To this day, when I just went down there, she cooked a brisket. And she can cook a brisket. And let me tell you, she don't even use a pit. She does it in the oven, but I don't know what she does, but that thing comes out so good. <laughs> she cooks this brisket, and I'm sitting with my mom, and I'm thinking, like, she's in her 70s, all her life, she's prepared a plate for the neighbor. And it, it hit on me like consistent. Ooh. Consi it's like it, she don't even think about it, I think, anymore. She just goes in there, and she's thinking about somebody else. Now, most of y'all know, and my mom might be watching, my mom got saved about two years ago. I'm going to tell you, she was doing that stuff before she was ever saved. So don't ever think that God can't use unsaved people to show you things. Don't ever think that, that, that you're too far away. My family's not like God is using things right now. There's things right now that you can't even recognize. You're not seeing it, but you're going to see it. You're going to look back on it and go, wow, God's hand's been on us all these years. My mother became a demonstration to her children. She was a definitely a demonstration to me. I can't speak for my other brothers and sisters. But for me, my mother was a demonstration of loving your neighbor as yourself. Before I ever knew that was in the Bible, before I had ever read it, before I had ever stuck onto it, before I was ever trying to do it, my, God said, I'm going to teach you how to love your neighbor. I'm going to give you a mama that cares about others. And I think, wow, I had a demonstration all my life. God was speaking to me. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I didn't see it till recent. 
How many demonstrations are happening around you right now? All around you. But you're putting limits on God and you're saying, well, they're not a follower or they're this or they're that. You know, you might, you might learn something more from a Gentile. That's in the Bible. <laughs> you might learn something from somebody that's far from God right now, but God's got a plan for him. And you're just, not, you're just on this side of the plan. He hadn't come to fruition of understanding Jesus, but he's on his way. And God may use people that you least expect to speak into your life and to be a demonstration of what he wants us to become and what he wants us to be, to love. The word today is love. I know some of y'all came in here going, man, I hope he talks about the supernatural. I hope he talks about deliverance. I hope he talks about faith. I hope he talks about something that makes me feel good, that the hair on my head, I'm, I'm, the hair on my head, the hair on my hand stands up. I want to feel the, the feel on the back of my neck. Sorry, we're talking about love today. We, 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 we may, because in the Bible, God puts love as the primary thing. 1 Corinthians 13, read that chapter. And today we're going to talk about love because everything has to come from love. If you don't, in that chapter, he says there's three things that will remain, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these, above faith, above great mountain-moving faith, above your ability to lay hands on the sick and heal them, if you don't have love, you don't have nothing. That's what the Bible teaches. But we put all of our emphasis on the supernatural. And listen, I'm not against the supernatural. I want the supernatural to happen, but it needs to be rooted and grounded in love. Or else we got it mixed up. Romans 13. Romans 13, verse 8 through 10 says this. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. That means that you have filled fully the requirement of the law when you love one another. <laughs> For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not covet. And I love this one. And if there's anything I missed, if there's any other commandments, they're all summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So whatever you can come up with, he's saying, you can sum it up. You can sum up the new way to live. You said if you got saved and born again, there's a new way to live, and it's loving your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> You're like, oh, man, I don't like my neighbor. He probably don't like you either. You know, we, we talk, we, sometimes we're like, man, they're so hard to love. And I'm like, you're hard to love. Then think about that. I mean, come on. It's like, we're like, man, you're so, man, this, this person's difficult. And you're like, yeah, you are too. You're a difficult person to live with. When we wake up and we understand, man, I'm difficult, you're difficult, we're all difficult, we all flawed. We're all flawed. And God is saying, I want you to look past the flaw, because I did. When I climbed up on that cross, I looked past your flaw. And I got up on, and I saw the potential in you. I saw what I made you to be. I saw the thing that has never manifested out of you. I still see it. I still believe in it. And I'm going to climb up on that cross and die for you so that you can come alive in me. And I want you to do the same thing that I did for you. I want you to do it for others. Come on, we all want God, God, Christ to die for us, but we don't want to die for no one. We want to live. Hey, when I first started preaching, I was so bad. And I, I was so insecure. I, I always came off the stage and I'd be like, babe, what did you think? Was that any good? Did I do any? Is it good? And she would be looking at me like, did you say what he told you to tell you? To tell them? I'm like, well, yeah, well, that's enough. It doesn't matter that, it, that, that somebody thinks it's good or doesn't think it's good. It matters that you spent time in the word, that you heard from God, and you asked God, what do you want me to tell the people on Sunday? And then you tell it. 
and you run with it, you can run with it or you cannot, but I'm just, I'm delivering a message. Let me, t- let me help everybody. When, when, I got off, when I would get off the stage and, and I cared about what people thought, that's, your, that's my flesh. And the flesh doesn't care how it lives as long as it lives. And sometimes in our religiousness, our flesh continues to live. And we mask it because we're preaching, we're teaching, but there's a lot of flesh in it. And we're supposed to kill the flesh. We're supposed to die to ourselves. Die. When I say kill the flesh, I mean die to ourselves. I mean, I mean, we're supposed to not care about ourselves, but care about the kingdom of God. So in your scripture, your main scripture, kids, up here, I need you to write Romans 13, 8 through 10. Romans 13, 8 through 10. Help them out, mom and dad. Just help them out. Put it, put it in there. Get something. Write it, get, write it down. I love John 3, 16 because Jesus met the requirement of the law through his love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It's a picture of loving us. It's a picture of love. And, he, and the Bible says that Jesus came. He didn't came to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. He fulfilled it at the cross when he died for his neighbors, for his people, for us, for me, and for you. So there's a new way of living. So we've got to understand some things about love. There's a, there's a new way of living. We can't, God doesn't save us and leave us how we are. He does expect us to grow. There is a cultivating time of our lives. If you're married, by the time you celebrate 30 years of marriage, there should have been a cultivating time of, of relationship where your relationship today is way different than it was their first year of marriage. Your relationship, so when you marry God at the altar and you say yes to him and you get married with him, because that's what you're doing. When you give your life to Jesus, it's a marriage ceremony. We're giving, we're giving our, we're taking on his name. We're becoming the bride of Christ. And so then when we get married and we spend time together and we go on a honeymoon together and we do life together and we go on getaways together and we spend time together, are you following me? See, everything that you do in the natural with a husband and a wife is really to teach you about the supernatural of what you're supposed to be doing with Jesus and you. Because the husband and wife thing is for here. It's for this temporal time. But, but we're going to be with him forever. He's going to be my groom forever. And so when I watch my wife, I have to learn the characteristics of my wife and how she deals with me so that I can have that because I'm, I'm a male. I don't know if anybody noticed. <laughs> and so I don't have the characteristics of a female in me. And so when, when I watch my wife, I see the characteristics, the characteristics of a female and how she relates to God and how she relates to me and because it doesn't come natural to me, I learn from her because she also is the image and likeness of God. Because we're both the image and likeness of God. So when we come together, we give a fuller expression of the image and likeness of God. Now, you're not incomplete if you don't have a man. And if you don't have a, a, a woman, you're not incomplete. But there is a fuller expression that comes from, because he made male and female. The Bible says he made male and female. He made them both. Are y'all all right? It's Okay. Okay, so there's a lot to learn, men. There's a lot to learn. Ladies, there's a lot to learn. He's not just annoying. I know we can be annoying. I get it. But we're the image and likeness of God too. And vice versa. So I was laughing this Weekend, somebody was saying something, and they were like, he's operating under the annoying, not the anointing. (laughs) I thought that was funny. I was like, wow, okay, I never heard that before. So the Bible says that love is the center. If you're going to take notes on the backside when you're drawing a picture, I want you, kids, I want you to draw a big heart and a bullseye, because love is the center. 
Everything comes from love. Everything comes from love. Everything, is, it's the center. First John 4, 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another. Listen to this. Beloved, let us, I'm in First John 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Now, I'm about to read this. It's not me. It's in the Bible. Anyone who does not love does not know God. I'll say it again. Anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Isn't that something? We, we, that's pretty powerful. When we refuse to love, I mean, he doesn't put no conditions on this, guys. There's no conditions on this. Like if they did you wrong, you're okay, you don't have to. <laughs> like if it really hurt, if somebody really betrayed you, there's no condition on it. He's saying, look, if, if, you, if, you, if you don't love, then God, you don't know God. That is a powerful, that's a hard, what are we to do with that? You can't do it without the Holy Spirit. Today we celebrate Pentecost, Pentecost Sunday. Today's Pentecost Sunday. I, I'm gonna tell you that it should be Pentecost every day. If it were, I'd make every day Pentecost day. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And Saturday too. Wherever you're at, you should operate in the Holy Ghost. But God gave us the Holy Spirit. Listen, he gives us the Holy Spirit so that we can walk this out because you cannot walk it out without the Holy Spirit. It's hard to love your enemy. Can I get an amen from anybody? You know, it's hard. But yet he, he commands it. You should love your enemy and you should love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the commands of God. What are we supposed to do with that? We're supposed to be able to deal with those things. We're supposed to be able to obey those things. He, we, see, we were created to be imitators of him. We were, we, all of us were created to, we were made in his image and his likeness to be represent, representatives of him, ambassadors of him on this earth. And he, if we want to know love, we must know God. You can't love without knowing God. And we know God, listen, we know God through the Spirit and through the Word. How do I know God? Through the Spirit and through the Word. Can I help everybody in here? If, 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 the, if you think the Spirit is telling you something, the Spirit will never tell you anything that would contradict the Word of God. Everybody in here that's a believer should write that down and know that. If you want to test the Spirit, you want to know you go to the word. If you can't back it up with the word, it's probably not the Holy Spirit. It's probably a spirit. But it's not the Holy Spirit. Because that Holy Spirit is not going to tell you to divorce your husband. It got quiet in here. Dang. You gotta go back to the word. You gotta line up to the word. Whatever you think the spirit is telling you, he gives us the spirit. I'm not removing the supernatural. It's there. And it's there for us to, to he impresses things in our heart. And then, he, and then we should know the word. Listen, if you wanna be protected, that's God's method of protection for you. It's a method, if, you want, if you're mentored by somebody and they get outside of the word, you can figure that out. If you're at a church and they're outside of the word, you can figure that out. You can, you can hear it and say, whoa, I don't know. Wait, wait a minute. You know, it reminded me of Google today. If, if I'm ever in the car and I say something, uh, some stat or something to my kids, they will sit in the back seat and Google it just to confirm that dad is right. And if dad is not right, they will take the opportunity to point out the fact that according to Google, dad, that's not right. When I was growing up as a kid, there was no Google. So if mom and dad said something was, something was up, it was just up. If they said, no, we don't do that because if you do that, this is going to happen. We're like, oh, I ain't doing that. 
And today we live in a culture that wants to check everything out. Come on, if your mama tells you she loves you, you got to check it out. We've become, we've become a generation where we're always, and, and the other thing too is what's crazy, is we'll take anything off Google. Just because it comes up first, it must be right. And you know what I'm talking about? You Google something, the first one, oh, that's got to be the one because it came up first. And the internet knows that the best one comes up first. Got nothing to do with money. Some of y'all are like, what? Are you serious? God commands us to love. It's our new way to live. Love is the fruit of the Spirit. Can I ask a question today? How many of y'all are born again Christians? Raise your hand if you are. How many of y'all believe you received the Holy Spirit? Amen. There's a fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5 that the Bible talks about. Now, how many of y'all, when you got saved, that you came up and you gave your life to Christ, the Bible actually says that at that moment, the Spirit seals you. Right? And, and, the, and the, the Spirit gives you this fruit. How many of y'all got saved and immediately when the pastor laid hands on you and you said the prayer or whatever you did, however you did it, you just all of a sudden, boom, you became kind. <laughs> or you were gentle. Anybody? Not me. Just wanted, I'm, I'm looking for that person that said, yeah, I gave my life to Christ and the fruit of the Spirit became evident in my life from that moment forward. It's not true. It doesn't happen that way. It does not happen that way. It, the Spirit of God is almost like a seed that has to be cultivated. Because fruit, hey, y'all know fruit? Had anybody ever planted a, a, a seed for fruit? Anybody? See, how, many, how many people planted fruit before? Raise your hand high. How many people actually ate something off what you planted? It, there's less hands. There's less hands. Because we all try it, but not all of us do it, right? So when that fruit, did it come up right away? When you put the seed in there, did you go out the next day and say, where's my oranges? Why, what's, the, what's going on? This must not work. There's no oranges. No, you got to water it. You got to be patient. You got to watch it. You got to keep the weeds out of it. You got to keep the ants off of it. You got to keep... You got to plant other things, right, Mark? I'm, I'm just, I studied it a little bit since I've met you. You got you to know the ground. You got to be patient. You got to hope it rains or pull a, pull a water hose over there or something. And it takes all this time to cultivate. That's the way it is with kindness and gentleness and even love. Some of us get discouraged because God says, it's the fruit of the Spirit. You should have love in you, and you have none. <laughs> it's okay. Listen, don't get, don't get antsy. It's okay. If everybody was honest in here, I mean, if we really got honest in here, if I could get a picture of your life on the big screen and play it, or mine, I would not play it. Because I am so lacking in the fruit. I'm cultivating that in my life. You should be cultivating that in your life. So listen, don't get discouraged if you're not there. Just begin to cultivate. Start doing something. Some of us, man, we've let that garden just overgrow and things have taken over and it looks a mess and we just need some good old-fashioned hard work, elbow grease to get in there and start reading the word again, start praying again, start worshiping again, start going to church again, be consistent, watch it. You can't fix it in one day. Come on, it didn't get overgrown in one day. It, it, over, it overgrew over time and it's gonna take time to get it cultivated back. And I'm here to tell you today that that's all you have to do. What, what's my decision today? All you've gotta do today is decide, I'm gonna start cultivating my garden. I'm going to give the Holy Spirit a chance to grow some fruit in my life. And maybe when you're 20 years, 10 years, see, we don't, we don't want to think that way. We, we want fruit now. Come on. McDonald's takes three minutes. We're like, what is wrong with you people in here? It's supposed to take a minute and a half. You got some guy making $7 an hour like, really, dude? You're going to get all over me because we took three minutes? 
We're in this in environment where we want it now. We don't know how to cultivate. We don't know how to work. We don't know how to get into the word and let the word do the work and grow in love and grow in kindness and grow in gentleness and, and, and try different things every year. Love has to be the center. Love has to be the center. The second thing is love is, has to be action. They're, 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 love is not a feeling. It's an action. So kids, draw a big heart for love and draw your best idea of what action would look like, like somebody running. I'm curious to see. This. And, when, and when you draw it, parents, this is what I want you to do today. Who, I want, I want you all to all take a picture of that draw a picture part and I want you to post it so that I can see what everybody drew. Because I need some entertainment this afternoon, okay? 1 John 3, 18 says, obedience to the word is an expression of my love. It says, God, Jesus said, if you love me, obey. John 14, he said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. <laughs> he, it doesn't say in the Bible, if you love me, you'll come to the altar, raise your hands and sway with me. If you, I'm not against raising your hands and swaying, hear me. But that's not, that doesn't prove my love for him. In fact, when you feel him at the altar in a worship experience, and you come to the altar and you experience his touch, because it's real. When you watch people come to the altar and fall to their knees and begin to just repent and begin to get somewhere with God, it's real. When they come up here and they're weeping and they're, it's real. When, 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 when you're jumping and you're getting excited and emotional, it's real. God gave us emotion and he gives us all of that emotion. He gives us all of that experience to lead us into a place of obedience. He wants you to feel him here so that you're obedient out there. But if we stop at feeling him, then our love has no action. And our love is just experimental and experiential. And God is saying, I'm not against that. I want you to feel me. I want you to know that I am God. I want you to know that I am with you. I want you, how many, you know, I feel his presence. I speak in tongues. I worship God. I get along with God and have moments of awesome time. But if I walk away from there and don't obey his word, my expression is lacking. So love is the center, but love is also an action. And he's saying, I want you to obey me because it is the expression of love. He says, I don't want you to just talk about it. I want you to do it. God does not want an outward. Listen, here's another thing. And hear me right, church, because when I'm talking about this, I'm really talking about things that I've walked through, that I've overcome, that I had to get revelation on because I used to be all about the outward expression. I used to be able to walk in. I, wanted, I, didn't, I didn't wanna walk in here into the church and act like, I, I, and act real. <laughs> I was gonna put my best foot forward. I was gonna walk in here like everything's going on. I got it going on. Everything's going great. And I learned that what, what happens with that is it becomes an out, it's all on the outside. It's, it's the shell. It's what you're allowing people to see. Do you see what I'm saying? So we can act like we're obedient to God, but in the private places, we're not obedient to God. Do you see what I'm saying? And then that becomes exhausting for a Christian, and Christians begin to burn out. Christians begin to feel like isolated. There's a, there's a dryness and because we're trying to put this show on because we don't, because maybe we signed up for leadership and we've been leading for 10 years and we've gotten in a place where we've gotten disconnected inside and that disconnection's grown and grown and grown, but we can't let anybody see because I don't want to let pastor down. I don't want to let people down. And we're hurting and we're miserable and our, our families are falling apart. Our kids are going crazy, whatever. You, you, you name it and, it and and the devil has you just hamstrung because you're trying to you're trying to out of your own power uphold this outward expression 
man, man, you don't have it on the inside. And God said, no, 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 this is what I want. I want, I want to love you on the inside and transform you in such a way that the outward expression is a leak of what's on the inside. You see what I'm saying? It doesn't mean that we shouldn't have an outward expression. It doesn't mean that you got to walk in here every day and say, man, I'm really messed up. It means that our focus should be on the inside transformational relationship. Me with God. Is God doing something in me? Is he show, listen, has he shown you something today that you can lop off, change, adjust, that will bring you closer on the inside, that will manifest on the outside? We're so law focused. <laughs> Don't you all like, I used to, I'm a checklist guy, so if somebody comes with it, hey, here's seven ways to get close to God. The three ways to do this, the five ways to do that. I'm not against that. I mean, I know, how, I know that they're teaching. But if you give that to me, not, not, not anymore, I've grown, but if you would give that to me early on in my Christian walk, I'd have got that checklist and done all seven of them and then stood there and be like, it's not working. Why is it not working? I did everything on the checklist. What is, why is God not happening? Because it wasn't ever meant to be a checklist outward. It was meant to get this stuff in you, start thinking this way, become this thing on the inside of you. And when you become it, it comes out of you. You just leak. You know, we're always, sometimes I get, I get frustrated with evangelism too because we, we, we're always trying to t get you to evangelize. Bring somebody to church, give you a ticket, give you that. It should leak out of you. If I got to tell you, it's not that good news. The good news ain't that good. It's just news. Am I right? Y'all all right? Don't leave, okay? Hang, hang tight. I know. <laughs> Don't leave. <laughs> uh, we'll edit that out of the live stream, please. Love is action. Don't just talk about it. He wants us to do it. It's a demonstration. You know, the world wants it. We just need to demonstrate it. They just, they're so hungry. The world is just so hungry for the real thing, for somebody that's genuine, somebody that's real, somebody that's just not going to fake it. Somebody's really going to believe what they say they believe. It's going to be not just believe it, not just out of, you know, not just saying it, but really living it. And the last thing I want to say is that love is not just the center, and love is action. The last one is love has power. So kids, I want you to draw a heart, a heart with a dynamite, a dynamite stick, because love has power. In 1 Peter 4, 8, it says that it has the power to overcome sin, that love covers a multitude of sin. Love covers a multitude of sin. There's a principle in the Bible that says that we reap what we sow. Anybody ever heard that? You reap what you sow. The world would call it karma, but it's really, a, it's not karma, it's a biblical principle of sowing and reaping. That if you plant something, you're not gonna get something that you didn't plant. You're gonna get more of what you planted, right? So here's the thing. Love has power to cover a multitude of sins. It is our job to love people even in their sinfulness. It's the kindness of God that leads men to repentance. It's not the correction and rebuke of God that leads men to repentance. It's the kindness. It's the fact that when a sinner gets found in his sin, that somebody would still love him. That blows them away. Because everybody will reject them. You know, it's like we run into somebody in sin, and we're like, Ugh. I don't want to get that on me. I'm supposed to be set apart from them. You were, you're set apart to get you to a place to get sent back in. You, you were set apart for him, not from them. <laughs> you're not, the, the setting apart is not from them. The setting apart is I set myself apart for him to be a vessel to be used and willing to be sent into everything. And listen, if we want to get, if we want to reach people in sin, you're going to get messy. It's just going to get messy. You're going to get it all over you. On your shirt, under your nails. You, you're going to help them or you're not going to help them. 
And you can't be worried about getting it on your shirt and walking around and some other Christian going, oh, where you been? What you doing there? God's like, don't worry about them. We, we, we were made to be rescuers of people. It covers this. I'm a, can I give everybody, I mean, if you don't get nothing out of today, I'm gonna tell you this. If you know somebody that's struggling, I dare you to give them grace and mercy and love as much as you can right now. Because there's gonna be a day when you're struggling and you're gonna need it. You're gonna need somebody to show up and give you mercy and grace and love. And if you don't give it, if you don't sow it, you're only gonna reap what you gave. So if we reap, if we sow self-righteousness self and judgment and all that, that's what you're gonna get back. Oh, pastor, you're crazy with that stuff. Yeah, it's upside down. I'm gonna tell you right now, it doesn't make sense. It's upside down. The kingdom is an upside down kingdom. He says, well, to be first, you gotta be last. Come on, he says, if they do wrong to you, love them. It's upside down. It's all upside down. Now, I don't know if that'll work. Why don't you try it? Why don't you, why don't you go try loving somebody, having mercy on somebody and having grace? See what happens. Give it a shot. What you got to lose? You've been, you've been correcting and rebuking all your life and it hadn't worked. <laughs> Come on, somebody. What's the matter, Valerie? Is that too hard? Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. She looked down. I was like, I made Miss Valerie look down. Oh, Lord. It has the power to overcome sin. It has the power to define me. Love has the power to define me. He's, John 13, he says, you're going to know that they're going to know you belong to me, how you love one another. So based on my love, people are going to know who you belong to. They're going to know who your daddy is based on how you love. How you love, you're going to look like your dad. No love, you look like your dad. <laughs> if you love, you look like your dad. My identity is rooted in my love. They, you know, that's what John 13, 34 through 35 says. They will know you are mine by your love. If you want to change your identity, you got to change by loving. You got to start loving. We got to start loving. And the power also has the, the power. Love has power to cast out fear. First John 4, 18 says that perfect love casts out all fear. If you're filled with love, there's no place for fear. There's no place for offense. There's no place for sin. If you choose to fill your life with love, you take up the capacity for anything else to fill your life. You know, I talk about this having to do with sin, and, and one, of the, one of the things that I found in my life to get out of, sin, uh, out of focusing my life on my sin, it was I would focus my life on serving God. And this is, this is a great example of if you spend your time loving people, you won't spend your time in your stuff because you'll be busy loving people. And some of us want, are, have been asking for breakthrough, looking for breakthrough, wanting God to move, asking God to move. And God is saying this morning, if you will just start loving people, just fill your whole day, get up in the morning and say, who can I love today? Who, don't, hey, don't love those that are around you that you love all the time. Stretch yourself. Find somebody that you can call and say, hey, man, I want to bless you with lunch. Hey, I want to bless you with dinner. Hey, let me cut your grass. Hey, let me, whatever it is. Find somebody to love. And listen, you can't do it one time. You got to do it every day. And I'm going to promise you this. If you, get about, if you get about loving people, you won't be about sinning. You won't be about your stuff. You'll be so out of your stuff because you'll be so busy loving. And your breakthrough is on the other side of serving others and loving others. It's a new way to live. Oh, man, I thought we were going to cast out devils. We are in love. And I'm going to tell you right now, you don't need to say, if, if you walk in his love and you walk in a room and there's a demonic presence, it's leaving. 
It is leaving. It ain't going to entertain a discussion with you. It's going to be like, we got to go. <laughs> we got to go. It has the power to cast out fear. If you spend your time loving people, you'll spend less time in your mess. But I'm going to tell you all this, church. Just stand with me today as we close. I'm going to tell you this today, church. Listen, you can't love. You can't do what I just said without Jesus. And I don't know who's in here, and I don't know who brought you, and I don't know what got you here. But if you're in here today and you don't know Christ, you don't have a relationship with him, you've never surrendered your life to him, I'm not just talking about a prayer. I'm talking about a true surrender on the inside of your heart where you made a decision and said, man, I'm going to start living for God. You could have walked a thousand altars and not made that decision. You could have prayed a thousand prayers and your heart might have not be in there. But today you're in here today and you're saying, man, that's me. I said yes to Jesus, but I haven't been walking in love. I'm not walking in the new way of life. My first call is for anybody in here that doesn't know Christ, and you know you have no relationship with him. You can't move forward without a relationship with him. If that's you, I want you to get out of your chair and come to the front. Anybody in here need Jesus? Anybody in here far from Jesus today that needs Jesus today? Anybody? Anybody? Just get out of your chair and come. I know it's going to be tough. I know. Yeah, just come on. Come on, get out of your chair. Say, I'm not, I, I, I don't feel that I'm right. Don't leave here not right. Anybody else need to come? Anybody else all over the building?